<clears throat> Hello everyone, this is Dale from the Precept Classes in Coleman, Alabama, and I thank you for joining us for our continued study in 2 Samuel. What we're looking at today is Lesson 4, Lesson 4, and this is a lesson that's replete with um, incest and rape and uh, revenge and murder and all sorts of uh, evil things that are occurring, so let's just get to it real quick. We actually looked at chapters 13, 14, and 15. And in these chapters, we're beginning to see some of the fruit of the sin, the consequences of the sin that David had committed because the Lord had told him through the prophet that there, uh, the sword would never uh, depart from his family. I think that's why the earthly family is here and that certain things would happen. We're introduced to several characters here. The first one is Amnon and Amnon was David's firstborn and was the apparent heir to the throne. And Amnon loved his half-sister Tamar. He had it really, really bad. Now these uh, young people were probably... And they're what we'd refer to as their teenage years. We don't know how old they were, but more than likely they were. And so he, he loved her so much, probably the more correct word would be lusted her so much, that he made himself sick in thinking about her and desiring her. Well, he expressed this one day to his cousin Jonadab, and Jonadab devised a plan. Okay, he devised a plan, and you see Jonadab in all through the story at the beginning and at the end. The plan was executed, and it was a plan of deception, and again, hatred and rape and anger and murder. And so Amnon feigned sickness, uh, was laying upon his bed, and when his father, King David, came to see him, he requested of his father that he send uh, Tamar, Tamar to come and prepare food for him, make him feel better. Well, the king agrees to that. Tamar comes. And fixes the food for him. And when she does, he uh, seeks to have his way with her. And she tried to uh, push him away by saying, don't, don't do this, don't do this. Father will give me to you if you will just ask him. The king will give me to you. Which he would not have done probably because that went against the Levitical law. Anyway, uh, Amnon forced himself upon her. And when everything was said and done, uh, one of the saddest scriptures in all the word was that the hatred that Amnon had for her was greater than the uh, love that he had had for her. And it speaks of what happens when we go out and seize things in the flesh. Well, David heard about it and David was very angry, but David did nothing. And we see here uh, a problem and a pattern in David's life that he was inconsistent in applying the word of God and the word that he knew to his family. He would execute it upon other people, but not upon the family in the way that he should have. We need to learn from that. So because of this, uh, Tamer was desolate and lived in her brother's house. Absalom was her full brother. She didn't live with her dad. She lived in their brother's house because of this. Absalom laid in wait <clears throat> literally two years. And uh, you read the account there in the 13th chapter. He uh, set in action a plan whereby he was able to kill Amnon. He told his servants to kill. And it was very Joshua-like. He said, be bold, be fear not. I've told you. Have I not told you? And so they killed him. Uh, well, Absalom had to flee because of this. And this is what we're beginning to see, that the sword will not pass from the house of David. His firstborn is dead. One of his daughters is desolate. And his thirdborn is estranged. Now, Absalom was the thirdborn in line. <clears throat> there was another son that is mentioned uh, that was the second born. He's called, born. He's called uh, Daniel in one uh, portion of the scripture. And Chiliab, I think, in another portion. And we don't see anything about him. And so we're careful with arguments from silence. But generally speaking, we believe that he must have died somewhere along the way. So now Absalom would be the one that would be the next one in line for the throne. Well, in chapter 14, we see that Joab was perceptive, and he understood that David desired to see Absalom. Absalom had been in exile for a couple of years now, and so uh, Joab hired a, a, an actress, is what I call her, from Tekoa, to present really a contemporaneous parable. She came in and told the story about what happened to her, about the uh, one uh, in her life that had been killed, her husband, and then her sons had got in an argument. One son killed another son. Now the other son should die according to the law. Well, David ruled properly on this. And then the woman said, can I speak to you, king, forthrightly? He said, sure, speak. And she says, you need to return the banished one. It is a sin against Israel. Very bold statement that she made. I'm amazed by this. <clears throat> David realized that Joab was behind the account. And so he asked her about it. She said, yeah. And so David allowed for Absalom to come back to the city, okay, to come back to the city. So Absalom returned. He was not allowed to see David uh, for two years. And Absalom was so frustrated, he kept trying to see him. And apparently Joab had some uh, input into this, sort of like a chief of staff in today's um, society. And so Absalom uh, couldn't get a response from Joab. Absalom actually sent his servants out and set Joab's fields on fire, 
Okay, he said, and that got his attention. And so Joab arranged for the meeting. Absalom went in before the king, and they apparently they reconciled, and all was well. Joab, I mean, uh, Absalom bowed down before the king. Uh, king David kissed his son, and it looked like everything was fine, but such was not the case because Absalom was very cunning, uh, very deceitful. Uh, and he also was allowing this stuff over this period of years to build up with him in bitterness. So we see in the 15th chapter, that, uh, well, a continuation of the story in 14 and 15, that Absalom was uh, very, very handsome, had very thick hair. He was probably very articulate. He was shrewd. His hair was so thick that he cut it once a year, and uh, it weighed five pounds, 200 shekels, five pounds. So he comes to his father, Absalom does, and says, Can I go to Hebron? I have a vow that I'd made, and I need to honor the vow. And King David says, Yeah, but he was really... Uh, executed in a conspiracy. And so he goes there, and one of David's counselors, uh, uh, Ahithophel, it's always hard for me to say that, Ahithophel, I call him Phil, really, we believe to be Bathsheba's grandfather, went with Absalom. Well, when all this happened, Absalom had these 50 runners, and he had told uh, the runners to go out. He had told his people, when you hear the trumpet blow, everybody rise up and say, Absalom is king, Absalom is king. Well, they did it. And then Absalom comes back, and David hears about it, and uh, it, he fled. Okay, He didn't abdicate, but he fled. And you have a very poignant account there of all the people that were trying to go with him, the things that they wanted to do. Well, David wound up fleeing. He winds up going down, going up the Mount of Olives. It's very much a type of what we see in the Lord Jesus Christ later. He was barefoot. Uh, he did not look kingly at all. Well, David left behind ten concubines to keep the house. Um, this was also going to be fulfilled, the word that was brought to him by the prophet. He also left behind the uh, the priest Zadok, not Zado as it says there, but Zadok and Abiathar, and left the ark. Zadok and Abiathar had come out to uh, go with the king. He says, no, no, but leave the ark back there. Y'all stay back. Um, you know, if this is of God, then it's of God. If I'm supposed to come back, I will come back. And then there was a guy named Hushai who was described as David's friend. And he wanted to go with David. And David said, will you please stay back to counter the counsel of Ophel? And uh, this, this friend agreed to do this. So these guys, Hushai, Zadok, Abiathar, and the, the, a couple of sons of the priests were literally laying down their life to get information back to King David about what was going on. Uh, David trusted the Lord to return or not to return. He knew that his sin was forgiven, and but he also knew that these consequences were probably as a result of that sin. Uh, we had several great questions in class related to all this kind of stuff. Somebody says, you know, you don't see David inquiring of the Lord right here. And you're absolutely right. You know, he did not inquire of the Lord from what we see in Scripture. He may have. He might have just simply understood that this was a part of what he was going to have to pay. He did, beyond any shadow of doubt, trust in the Lord and know that God would take care of him. And so we should do likewise. We should trust in the Lord. We should inquire at all times. Who knows what the Lord might do? Again, I'm Dale from the Precept Classes in Cullen, Alabama, and I thank you for being with me. And I'll see you again next time. Goodbye.